Steve, um, great to have you back on Zeros. Really looking forward to today's subject matter, which is Lex Greensill. You know, when we discussed this, uh, this kind of special a few weeks ago, I was thinking that I was going to intro this as um, Credit Suisse's latest f*** up. But um, a week has passed. <laughs> It appears more has transpired, and um, this might not even be the worst f up of the quarter for them. So um, <laughs> I'm glad we were able to get you on in uh, in short time to cover it. So thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Well, thanks for having me. I'm look really looking forward to it. You know, Lex Greensill, the um, Australian finance uh, whiz kid. Um, you know. For those people who are not familiar with him, um, he had a uh, trade financing company um, named after himself. We first came across Lex um, when we were looking at NMC, which was a UK listed um, Middle Eastern hospital operator, which had a significant amount of undisclosed debt on its balance sheet. Um, and, and truth be told, it, it was an amount that, you know, far overshot even in our wildest dreams what was going on. The part that Lex Greensill played in that was NMC had receivables that had been factored into trade financing facilities that Credit Suisse had packaged up which uh, have subsequently um, imploded. So that was about sort of late 20, uh, early 2020, late 2019. Um, Curious how you first came across uh, Lex Greensill. Well, I mean, it's, there's no sort of great trick or skill in any of this. I mean, the GAM share price fell by two thirds after they got involved with them. And Tim Hayward was found to be, I think he was, um, I'm told, I don't, I don't know what the public information is, but I'm told he was dismissed on a technicality because he hadn't declared the fact that he'd been riding around in one of Lex Greensill's jets, he hadn't declared that to compliance. But they, they were doing a huge amount of volume in his fund with Greensill and with Sanjeev Gupta of the GFG Alliance. And they were doing some quite interesting um, financing. But no, I just took notice of it because I hadn't come across Lex Greensill until I saw what happened at GAM. And I thought, oh, he looks a bit unusual. And there is probably going to be some interesting things going on. And um, last summer, I wrote a note with my pal Mark on Greensill because I'd been sort of talking about it and tweeting about it. And he said, oh, why don't we do a, Why don't we do a blog? And we just did this blog examining what had gone on. And Mark went through the, the fact that Greensill had sold a stake in, the, in his company to SoftBank. And it was like the most weird transaction. I mean, you know, not that I always understand Massasson's investment strategy, but even for him, this seemed like a stretch valuing Greensill at $3.5 billion, about 15 times trailing revenues for what looked like a fairly bog standard trade finance company. Um, Greensill didn't even have its own software. It used third party software to do all the transactions. Obviously, this is you know, you get multiple transactions because there, there's lots and lots of invoices going through. So you do need software, but it didn't even have software. So it seemed, you know, a really peculiar thing for SoftBank to get involved in. But of course, what subsequently transpired was that SoftBank not only bought a stake in Greensill, but it invested in the Credit Suisse supply chain finance funds, which purely coincidentally started lending money to SoftBank investees. So I always love the, you know, when you've got these sort of circularity of transaction, there's mm -hmm. usually a, a good reason for that. And the good reason is usually to disguise something. And you see it time and time again in, in frauds where you see companies converting um, capital into income or doing transactions through joint ventures and, and so on. You, you've, seen, you've seen more of it than I have probably. Your, your point on SoftBank is, is very interesting. The the 15 times revenue valuation, and I, I think actually in the, the failed pre-IPO round, they were trying to do a, a $7 billion valuation. Um, what I found so interesting about that is 
trade financing, even if you kind of like stand on your head and squint a bit, is not a sexy business. It's been around for a really long time. For people who are not as familiar with the business, it'd be great if you could just walk me through the nuts and bolts of what trade financing should be. Well, I mean, you're dead right. It's not sexy in the slightest. I mean, there is a bit of sort of interest in it because com some companies do use trade finance to disguise the real state of their balance sheet. And NMC is a good example of that. This is simply factoring your receivables, so getting paid early, or reverse factoring your payables, getting somebody else to pay your suppliers so that the, your working capital and your balance sheet looks looks more efficient. And you know, it's very easy to see from the, 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 the marketing documents for the Credit Suisse supply chain finance funds that what they're, what they're indicating is that this is a 150 bips over LIBOR kind of investment supposedly low risk and you know that's trade finance you know take a very small margin lots of volume and hopefully not too many um bad debts and there's nothing i i don't think there's anything exciting about it but you know greensill whom i don't know i've never met never even seen him speak but he obviously is a good salesman it's interesting he um you know he roped in some actually SoftBank aside, reasonably astute investors. Aside from Massa, who I think has a differentiated approach to everything, you know, there are actually some fairly credible people in there, you know, including the former prime minister. To what extent do you think his ability to romance people, take them on private jets, um, be in the room with prime ministers, I mean, to what extent do you think that really played a significant role in keeping this whole thing going? And to what extent do you think it was the ability to shuffle paper around? Or, or do you think they're kind of one and the same thing? Well, you know, you, you don't know when these things start, do you? So it's quite possible that the, you know, the high valuations created a need to create growth. There wasn't the growth in the business. So they started doing more and more outlandish things. But there's certainly evidence that um, before, the, before the GAM unwind, that they were doing some pretty aggressive financing, which was nothing to do with trade finance. I mean, the, the deal that um, Greensill engineered for Sanjeev Gupta to buy Rio Tinto's assets, the aluminium smelter and hydroelectric assets in, in Scotland, was you know quite an ingenious feat of financial engineering. Really, I mean, nothing to do at all with with trade finance. But uh, I think I mean, and this is just guessing. It's, uh, you know, looking at what where we are now and trying to work out how we got here. I'm guessing that there was quite a bit of pressure to you know to increase the top and bottom line, and therefore he was get, doing more and more aggressive things in order to engineer the growth. That's that would be. That would be my guess. But I, I can't imagine why General Atlantic got involved in the first place. I mean, the connection with Cameron goes back to um, Greensill spent time at Morgan Stanley and mm -hmm. Hayward, the, the, the head of the cabinet office, the chief, the, the, one of the most important civil servants, met him there. And it seems that he was brought in um, by the civil servant. And of course, Cameron then ended up signing off on a scheme which I mean, like, is the most extraordinary scheme where the National Health Service, which is the biggest employer in the UK, has just got, you know, a, I mean, an enormous budget where Greensill um, set up a scheme where Citigroup paid pharmacies early so that the National Health Service could pay them according to their normal supplier schedule. And well, if the, if the government wanted to help out small pharmacies, you could just tell the National Health Service, just pay them earlier. I mean, there's no, I mean, absolutely no need for a middleman. And obviously, if you've got a middleman, the middleman's taking a fee. So it started out being Citigroup, and then guess who it ended up being? Greensill. Interestingly, I just, just before I came on, I just, somebody sent me the, the Credit Suisse supply chain, um, the, the fact sheets for January, 
for the other funds. So I managed to get hold of the main fund, but I hadn't got hold of the other funds. And, and Credit Suisse, as you have seen, has taken them off the website. So now yeah. on the website, it doesn't have the names of the 10 largest positions. But I've got the January um, data. And guess who's on there? National Health Service is on one of the top 10 in one of the funds. You know, I mean, it makes no sense, right? Wow. Taxpayer, taxpayer is paying money so that the National Health Service doesn't need to pay its bills. I mean, anybody, you know, so ask a simple question. Why? No mm -hmm. reason. I want to go back and, and discuss the, the Rio deal because as I remember it, you know, they were questionable, like lower quality assets. And honestly, I, I think I read it first in, in the FT, who, you know, Rob Smith, some amazing coverage, both of uh, Gupta and of, of Lex Greensill. Um, you know, I, I honestly remember looking at it and uh, we spend enough time looking at fairly complex structures. I, I don't claim to be the world's sharpest financial engineer. Um, and I remember looking at it and just thinking, like, who's paying what and, like, where is cash flowing and how is any of this, like, economically viable? It'd be great for you to talk me through that just so that for my own edification I can work out how far wrong I was. I'm, I know no more than you. I mean, I, you know, I've been trying to get prospectus for that bond and <laughs> can't find the prospectus. I mean, it's amazing how... The, the date, you know, the information which should be, you know, public, uh, but easily available just doesn't seem to be that easy to get hold of. But the, I mean, Rio were keen to get rid of the assets. I'm not sure how bad the assets could be. I mean, they're modestly profitable. I mean, the, the, you know, what, what works in an aluminium smelter is having cheap electricity. And if you've got a hydroelectric plant in Scotland, where there's usually quite a lot of rain, then you should be, you know, you should have cheap electricity and you, it should be, it, it should be all right. Um, Gupta um, told the Scottish government that he was going to build a plant to manufacture alloy wheels and that this would be a great, um, you know, uplift for jobs in the area and that, you know, they should consequently help him raise the money. And of course, the plant never got built. I mean, what, why you would need to build a plant next to the smelter was something that I didn't really quite understand. But, you know, I mean, maybe politicians don't ask questions. You know, maybe you say, well, if you were going to build an alloy wheel plant, where would you build it? Maybe you would build it next to the car factory that is your principal customer. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you would imagine that it would cost quite a lot more to ship aluminium wheels than it would to ship aluminium. I would imagine. I mean, I, you know, I, I, again, I'm not a I'm not a, a, an expert in this. The alloy wheel plant, of course, never got built and sadly never will get built. I don't know how bad the assets were. I mean, I don't think, I, I don't think they were terrible. I mean, they real got a reasonable amount of money for them. And, and you know, the, the business had, had revenues and had profits. Of course, now we can't see what's happened since GFG bought the company because mm -hmm. we don't have any filings. So, you know, Trying to look into this is very, very difficult because if you don't have any financial data, then you, there's very little you can conclude. Where did Greensill end up figuring into the mix um, other than, you know, I understand that Gupta was able to, I think, raise a bond, right, from the Scottish government. Well, I mean, my understanding, and we don't have any sort of public information on this, but, you, you know, various people have got in touch with me and told me, given me insight, um, including some people that were involved in the inside. Um, and people, I'm told that it was Greensill that engineered all the structures. But uh, I mean, you know, it's a, a matter of difficult to, 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 to pin down. It would make perfect sense that Gupta did the transaction with the aid of Greensill, with the debt being picked up by GAM and um, I believe one other, one other party. In terms of... Um Digging into to other transactions, I, I know you've, um, you've been able through Companies House to pick up a few transactions that, on the face of it, don't pass the smell test. Companies with limited revenue, um, 
borrowing seemingly quite large amounts from from green seal funds um which of those stand out well the, i mean the one that um journalists at times actually spotted and i should have spotted but i i was there, there was so i mean so many things to look at you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um but the, the one that I thought was most interesting is there's a company called Prime Veer, and it was one of the largest obligors as of January 21. It, was, it owed $102.5 million to the Greensill, to the largest Greensill sourced Credit Suisse supply chain finance fund. I looked at this and I said, it's a warehouse in the Midlands. What? And it had like 4 million of turnover. I said, well, you know, there's obviously something weird about this. It turns out that this is actually a mortgage. It's the company is owned by the Barclay brothers, who also own Shop Direct, which is the, the company behind Very, which is a, an online retailer in, in, in the UK. And Very's got like two billion pound credit book. It was using um, Greensill and the Credit Suisse supply chain finance funds as a source of finance. But apparently that $102 million is a, is a mortgage. It's a long term mortgage. So the investors are investing in this fund on the basis that it's a short term supply chain finance fund. But it turns out that it, maybe some of it is, but not all of it. But there are, you know, random just looking through the list. I mean, there's a very long list, about 800 individual lines for the last filed accounts. I think they were October 2019, the supply chain finance fund filed uh, a, a long list of the individual securities that it owns. And in there, there were some weird names. And when you start looking up the weird names, almost every single one of them is weird. <laughs> I mean, it, it's absolutely extraordinary. I, in, the top, in the list of the top 10 obligors as of January, there were two lines. One was called BCC Bingera, and another was called BCC Ferrymead. I thought, well, what, what are these? I mean, BCC is a term for a, a reinsurer, but it can't possibly be an insurer. And Bingera and Ferrymead are sugar mills in Bundaberg, which is Lex Greensill's hometown. And I think, well, what, what the hell are these? And again, um, great work by the FT team. I mean, they discovered that this was a code name for Katera, which is a bankrupt construction company which is financed by SoftBank, which SoftBank rescued, gave Greensill some money so that it could roll over the debt into equity. But, you know, you just think, well, these are the two lines in the top 10. And you just wonder, mm -hmm. well, surely somebody in Credit Suisse was looking at what the fund was invested in. And surely they would have said, well, hang on a second, this doesn't look like we're going to get our money back. I could spend all day, every day looking at green. So, I, you know, I have no desire to do so. And um, I've got work to do. But uh, talking to various journalists, I mean, you know, one journalist said to me, he said, I've got your book and I'm going to read it, but I, I've got no time because I'm spending all my time in green. So, and, uh, you know, really, I mean, people are spending huge amounts of time. And, mm -hmm. and it's not just one journalist. I mean, it, it, there's several of them who are who are working on it. And I'm sure that there's going to be more stuff uncovered. I mean, you can hardly believe we're now in April and this started the first week in March when the insurance company withdrew coverage. But we had, it. I think it was 20 days in a row where I learned something that I was like, no, you couldn't do that. It's just an astonishing array of misdemeanors and shenanigans. I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating, actually. I got to say, I've... I have been absolutely blown away by the audacity of some of the scams. I mean, um, you know, this this concept of financing receivables that don't yet exist for sort of like potential future orders. I mean, that it's basically like an unsecured loan. Um, yeah, it's just, absolutely. It's so far away from what a supply chain financing fund should be doing. Um, the other thing that I've I found truly bizarre about this is typically you see these things get packaged up and, you know, there's obviously recently been 
a lot of furore around GameStop and how retail investors are being taken advantage of or, or ripped off or, or maybe winning sometimes. The underlying investors in this were sophisticated investors. This was not a product that was created and then dumped on, you know, a person going to HSBC who has like 50,000 pounds in their account. This was sold to highly sophisticated investors. It really calls into question what, if any, due diligence was done. Well, there are a thousand investors in this fund, and in my view, the FCA should go, I mean, to the extent that they're in the UK, the FCA should call them up and ask them what due diligence they did, because it would take you two minutes to look look at the list of, of, of the top 10 and ask yourself, well, what, who are these? Why, why are they borrowing the money? You know, Deutsche Börse nearly a hundred million dollars doesn't you know why would Deutsche Börse do that that doesn't make any sense you know it's my view that um, the regulatory authorities should take you know quite strong action and show that I mean all these people who are professional investors the vast majority of them will be fiduciaries you know most of them will have had a million dollars plus invested in the in these funds and clearly they've not done they've not done adequate due diligence because I think that even a bare minimum of due diligence would have would have protected you from investing. I think there's some big questions, and I'm hoping that the regulatory authorities will pick this up and say, you know what, we, we would like to make sure this doesn't happen again. I mean, the thing I, I was um, I had a call with somebody um, yesterday, one of my clients, and I, I said who's involved in the finance sphere, and I said to him, why are these guys not required to be regulated? You know, I and mean, Greensill claims like they've done over a hundred billion dollars of this financing why why is that not regulated you, you you need to be regulated to do anything in finance in the uk but not apparently to lend money and that seems to me and especially at this scale that seems to me bizarre and i think lex greensill himself got regulated at the tail end of 2019 but here's a company that you know it's a substantial business, $234 million of turnover, which um, a number of the people in the business are getting regulated. I think a dozen or so were, were got regulated. Yet they didn't have an in-house compliance function. And they, you, you know, they, they were regulated. They were regulated under the umbrella of one of these middlemen. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with the concept, but there's a few organizations here where you can sign up under their, under their umbrella. And, you know, you imagine that Credit Suisse would have said, well, hang on a second, uh, the people that are sourcing this, well, well, how are they regulated? What, what their compliance? You would imagine that Credit Suisse would have asked the question, what well, are your compliance arrangements? I don't know what the answer was, but I mean, it, it just seems, it seems bizarre. I mean, the red flags all over the place and nobody seemed to be asking any questions, which seems odd but hopefully they'll ask questions now because i think you know the most important thing with these things is to learn some lessons and make sure it doesn't happen again because you know there'll be other other people that will seek to take advantage of the same loopholes unless they're closed